All right. Well, uh, uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, wherever you are. Um, this is Sharif Kamil, uh, the Dean of the Business School uh, at the American University in Cairo. It's my sincere pleasure to welcome you all uh, to today's event, uh, which is uh, part of the webinar series organized by the John Gerhardt Center for Philanthropy, uh, Civic Engagement, and uh, Responsible Business. First and foremost, I hope that uh, you all, your friends, your families, your neighbors, your loved ones are all safe and in, in good health. Um, for years, we have been saying that disruption comes in different shapes or forms, uh, but more recently, we were always talking about technology as a disruptive mode. Well, uh, late 2019, early 2020, disruption came in a different form. It came through a pandemic that actually affected the lives and livelihoods of uh, so many people uh, around the world. Uh, the series, the webinar series put together by the John Gerhard Center at AUC was actually to address the issues uh, that uh, uh, were caused and the repercussion caused by uh, uh, COVID-19 and how the role of business schools in society uh, can help sort of navigate those uh, difficult, uh, uh, difficult times. Um, naturally, uh, business schools uh, are playing a role in the society, uh, try to, uh, through the programs, through the awareness campaigns, through the engagement of, with the community, to try to uh, not just look at their main core missions and programs and activities, but also uh, the well-being uh, of the community uh, given in those uh, difficult uh, times. Uh, the pandemic obviously um, affected, as I said, the lives and livelihoods uh, of uh, 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 so many societies around the world, it, uh, no discrimination, uh, no boundaries. Uh, it actually attacked uh, communities around the world uh, through a stealth attack, uh, the way I see it, uh, invisible. And we still live with repercussions. So we're talking about the second wave. Uh, and I think until um, a vaccine is accessible, affordable, uh, universally, uh, we will still be waiting for that next stage, or ho hopefully, uh, post-COVID, and hopefully it can come uh, uh, sooner rather than later. But the problem is, what are the repercussions? Uh, the divide, the, the imbalances in the community, uh, uh, the social perspective, the inequalities, uh, issues related to climate change, sustainability, governance, so many issues uh, that are out there that are affected naturally the sustainable development uh, goals of different uh, communities. Uh, the roles within the society, the ecosystem, private sector, the government, and in my mind, one of the most important elements uh, in the ecosystem, which is the civil society, which revolves around the most important asset of the society, which is, uh, which is people. Uh, I believe that this is an opportune moment, hopefully, uh, to autocorrect, to reset. Uh, I'm a strong believer that disruption uh, brings advancement in the same manner that challenges uh, bring opportunity. So with that uh, and these issues and many, many, uh, many more issues. We're extremely delighted at the Business School at AUC uh, to be hosting today Professor Henry Mintzmerk, uh, who will address a timely topic, the issue of a rebalancing uh, society, which uh, reflects the title of uh, one of his books, Rebalancing Society, Radical Renewal Beyond Left, Right, and Center. And we're shedding the light on the role of the Business School during and in the aftermath of COVID-19. Amongst the issues addressed will be management and healthcare system during and post uh, COVID. But let me very briefly uh, introduce uh, our uh, guest speaker today, Professor Minsberg, is a writer, uh, uh, an educator, uh, mostly about uh, managing orientations, developing managers, rebalancing society. He made his professional home in the Dizotel Faculty of Management at McGill University in Montreal. Uh, Professor Minsberg authored more than 20 books um, I read quite a few of them, including Managers, Not uh, MBAs, Minsberg on Management, Inside our, our Strange World of Organizations, Simply Managing What Managers Do and Can Do Better, and Managing the Myth of Healthcare. He also co-authored over 180 articles and numerous uh, commentaries. He co-founded and remains active in the International Master's Program for Managers and the International Master's for Health Leadership, something that is very much needed as we navigate uh, those difficult and unprecedented times. Professor Minsberg received his bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from McGill University and his master's and PhD degrees from the MIT uh, School of Management. Thank you, Henry, for being uh, with us today. It's a delight to, uh, to have you as our guest speaker in our webinar series. 
the floor is all yours. Okay, I will I will moderate. So let me just tell you the, the plan of uh, the, the plan of the webinar. Uh, I'm going to ask Professor Mintzberg uh, questions or, or do discussions. We're going to do this for 25 minutes, 30 minutes, and then we're going to have 20 minutes for Q&A. If you have any questions, please send them through the chat box to me, and I will direct them to Professor Mintzberg. Now, the COVID-19 pandemic came really at a time when societies uh, were fragile. If I use the, your expression, they were really out of balance. Uh, also, you could argue that effective managers who are trained to sort of deal well with disruptions and handle crises, uh, weren't, uh, there weren't many of them. So I want you to sort of tell us a little bit about uh, the going out of balance. What is a balance? What is, what is the impact of this? Why does what does society goes goes out of balance? What can we do about it, Professor Minsberg? You need to unmute, please. If you look at the recent history and the various problems that have arisen in the world, um, it seems to me they can be explained by an imbalance across three sectors of society. Um, I say three, uh, and yet we really focus on two. Uh, we've spent century, more than a century, focusing on public versus private, uh, manifested most recently or in recent years in a Cold War between East and West, uh, between the state-controlled uh, governments of the East and the market-influenced uh, 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 economies of the West. Um, and when the Berlin Wall came down and communism uh, was so-called defeated by capitalism or that capitalism triumphed, in, in fact, that wasn't true at all. Um, the communist regimes were totally out of balance uh, on the side of their public sectors. Uh, the public sector ruled and dominated. Um, the private sector was weak and largely directly controlled uh, by the public sector. And the third sector which I call the plural sector, which is known as civil society or, or the social sector or the sector for non-government organizations or nonprofits, all those institutions and associations that are neither business nor government um, is the third sector. And they were completely suppressed under communism and remain suppressed under communism in China, uh, whether it's Tiananmen Square or anything else, any kind of religious or social movement um, they're suppressed. Um, so it wasn't capitalism that triumphed so much as communism that brought itself down by the imbalance uh, that it uh, experienced. Um, but ever since then, because of the belief that capitalism has triumphed, capitalism is triumphing. And what we're getting in some countries, particularly the United States and the United Kingdom, the liberal democracies, so-called, they're getting less liberal and less democratic, um, uh, are going out of balance on the side of their private sectors. And the response of late in many countries has been a rise of populism, which is really the rise of imbalance in favor of the plural sector. So in Venezuela, uh, in Turkey, in, um, in Hungary, um, you're getting a rise of, of, of populist community movements. The, the plural sector is the community sector. So if you want to look for an overarching explanation of what's been going wrong in different countries, in different parts of the world over the last century, um, it's, it can really be explained by balance and imbalance. And one last thing. The United States was actually quite balanced before 1989. I mean, in the 60s and 70s, the country had very strong welfare programs that had very high tax rates. So government was strong um, and, and markets have always been strong in the States. And communities, the US is a country, has been a country of communities. Ever since we've seen uh, the corporate world and globalization becoming much more powerful, 
uh, governments in the United States becoming much less influential and the plural sector less influential. And maybe one last comment, the countries that seem to have it together today, and I would include countries like the Scandinavian countries, especially Denmark, New Zealand, uh, Germany, Canada, um, have maintained a balance more or less across the three sectors. Is, is this balance related to governance, proper governance? Is it related to governance? Governance, not government, governance. Government? Ecosystem governance. Uh, well, government is an element. Um, uh, I'm talking governance, governance, not government. Governance. Oh, governance, about ecosystem even, governance even, within, even within an enterprise? Uh, yes, sir, yes, sir. But I'm, I'm more yeah. talking about governance across. I'm talking about ecosystem governance. So you really have proper balance, checks and bounds between elements of an ecosystem. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah I'm not sure if I follow, but, but it, it seems to me that corporations themselves have gone severely out of balance um, because a healthy corporation clearly concerned about profit, clearly concerned about shareholders, um, but also is governed for all its stakeholders. Um, and when corporations go become so one-sided one and have so much influence in society, uh, then you have problems. You, can't, you can tolerate corporations that are imbalanced in a society that's balanced because you constrain the, the power of the corporation. Um, but you can't do that in a society where the corporations have so much power. And by the way, globally, uh, globalization is, has no countervailing forces. Um, there, there was a famous book by a Canadian economist named John Kenneth Galbraith, who talked about countervailing powers. Uh, and he said that when the power of corporations arose early in the 20th century, the unions gained power to countervail. Um, there's no countervailing power to corporate influence on the global scale. There's no government that can stand up to globalization, certainly not the United Nations, uh, which is weak, and, um, and, and the various countries, uh, um, the most powerful countries, that look after their own corporations. They don't worry so much about globalization. So Russia's concerned about Russian corporations and China's concerned about Chinese corporations and America's concerned about American corporations and so on. Okay, now let's talk about, uh, I mean, when you talk about a big purpose of the well balance that you're trying to achieve is more or less democratizing well-being of all the citizens, right? You yeah. wanna have everybody in well-being. And I think yeah. what, you're trying, what you're saying is that the plural sector really is what drives government to respond to inequality or to injustice. And they also drive businesses to be more responsible, right? So if they don't play their role, this causes the, the balance to happen, right? Right. I'll, I'll, I'll qualify, but yeah, more or less. I, okay. I, do you want to elaborate? I'm, I'm trying to understand how do you regain balance? What would it take to get balance back? Okay, okay. So um, change, I think, you know, Franklin Delano Roosevelt said something very interesting. Um, when an activist, a black activist, came and asked him to support a, a cause, he said, he said, in effect, uh, I, I, I agree, I, um, I agree, I want to do it now, go out and make me do it. Um, in other words, government, elected governments uh, need the will of the people and they need the force of the people behind them. And that force is the plural sector, it is communities. Um, and so change is, is, especially in a democratic country, but change in general is driven by, I think, not by the elites or the authorities, but by movements on the ground. And, and my favorite example is the Reformation of the 17th century, uh, which, which brought Protestantism and Luther, the Luther religion 
uh, to the fore and so on. And, and Martin Luther was a monk. He was an ordinary monk. He had no particular influence, no particular power. He was just a monk. Um, and he wrote a list of 95 theses on a piece of paper and he nailed it to the door of some church. I mean, big deal. Um, but then, unbeknownst to him, his students saw it, picked it up, and in today's terms, they use the new social medium to make it go viral. And by that, I mean the printing press was fairly new. And they took it, had it printed up, and within weeks, it was circulating because the people were so mad at the Pope and the papacy for corruption uh, that they were ready to change. So the whole reformation, which changed the whole Western uh, uh, Christian world enormously, um, was driven on the ground um, by a social movement, by a community movement. Um, and, and I think if we're gonna get changed, that's the way it's gonna happen. I think if we want, I, I, I've been doing a lot of work on it. We'll get back, we'll get to it later, I guess. But if we wanna make some progress on the pandemic, I think the authorities have, a, for the most part, been blind to everything but their main way of doing things, which is important but insufficient but masks and keeping distances and all that. And, and they're blind, they're blocked. Um, and the only thing that's going to unleash them is, is some kind of social movement that says, wake up, there's more going on here than you're doing. Um, so whether it's balancing society or getting past the pandemic or dealing with climate change, um, it's going to have to come from the ground initially, I think. Okay. So you're talking about the social change happens from the bottom and it has to be community driven or community invented. Yes, that's true. Yeah. Now, the problem is, is that you need a platform. You need a, a way of coordinating with the community, right? Because right. we've seen it in, in, in the, the, the Arab revolution, for example, the Arab, uh, that, that what happened yeah. is that there was, there was no uh, community platform. It was just sporadic and it ended up in no uh, result. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, how do you form a community platform? That's a, that's a major issue. Yes, that's a very interesting question. Um, nice way of putting it. Um, I'm just writing down. Um, Thomas Friedman did a column about Tahrir Square. Um, and he's, he quoted a, uh, an Egyptian friend of him, his who said that the social media are great for communicating, but not for collaborating. Um, and, and you can see that in, um, in the World Economic Forum compared to the World Social Forum. Because the private sector knows how to get its collective act together and they do that at Davos or in their chambers of commerce or whatever. So competing companies will cooperate, you know, uh, uh, Exxon or, or Esso will, will collaborate with Shell to get a certain tax break or, or whatever it is. They know how to work together. I attended the World Social Forum in Montreal. I've been to the other one too. And it was chaos. It was the epitome <laughs> of disorganization. It was pagai, as they say in French. It was, it was disorganization. Um, they, they couldn't get their, they don't get their collective act together because everybody's kind of working on their own. Um, but when there's a cause that's sufficiently important to people, as was the case uh, in the Reformation, um, then they just find ways to collaborate. And, and it starts in communities and then the communities connect. And, and, and what we have today um, are much more powerful social media um, that can enable, at least enable people to, to communicate um, and, and, and to work things out in their communities and, and you emanate what works in some communities. So if, if, if New Zealand has a way of dealing with the pandemic that nobody else does, I don't think that's true, but if it did, um, people emanate that. They communicate and they emanate that. Um, but I'd like to hold your question um, uh, um, because uh, how do you create a community platform? Because I, 
I think that's a big unanswered question. Um, and all we can do is look at cases where it happened. So was there a platform for the Reformation? I don't know if you'd call it that. Uh, uh, Luther, form, Luther gave the vision, if you like. Luther provided the vision, although if you read his 95 theses, they're mostly a rant about, about sins and, and you know, they're not very profound. And he didn't um, uh, sort of propose a new view of religion. He just wanted to get rid of the corruption. But eventually he wrote things that led to, to more uh, what, the what the Reformation became. So we're able to, you know, my hope is that something like rebalancing society or something else that people do could serve as a model for what we can do. Anybody who's watching can, can go on minsberg.org um, and they'll see the cover of my book, Rebalancing Society, and below it, they'll see a kind of model of uh, uh, going from imbalance to it's a kind of arch like this going from imbalance to balance. Um, and, uh, um, and it kind of describes how that can happen with social movements and social initiatives and social actions, and then some kind of consolidation around the vision, which in the Reformation's case uh, came from Luther eventually, or, or, uh, or in other cases comes, you know, I mean, not for the better, but Marx's... Uh, Manifesto, Communist Manifesto served as a vision for that kind of change. It wasn't the right kind of change, um, mm -hmm. but it served as a, if you like, the platform for change. Okay. Now, when you, I've, I've read some of your material and you repeatedly said that corporate social responsibility will never compensate for corporate social irresponsibility. And I, I also sensed that you sort of, uh, you always talk about win-win situation. B basically that the companies will actually uh, do, uh, do well by doing good. Now, my question, is that possible? Well, what, what we have now is so much corporate social irresponsibility. Um, not every corporation, lots of corporations are responsible, but the whole trend, has shifted so much, you know, you just have to open the newspaper any day and read about the banks in America, the, uh, the um, you know, the, uh, the uh, telephone companies playing games in, in all kinds of awful ways. You know, I tried to cancel a telephone service here in Canada and they kept sending me, they kept listening, saying, fine, we'll pass you to the next person. Each one wants you to tell the story. Then they pass you to the third person what are they doing? They're just trying to discourage me. It, it costs some money to have three people cancel a contract when one person can do it. Um, what they're trying to do is, is hope I'll give up. I, I call that legal corruption, okay? And I'm much more concerned with the legal corruption than the, than the criminal corruption. Um, and and it's, it's, it's a pandemic. It's everywhere. It, it, it's kind of dominating us. There, there was so much corruption and it'll, it won't stop until people get their collective act together. I'll give you a story that's in a book by Saul Alinsky, who was the great kind of activist for social movements. Um, and he talked about a town, San, San Antonio, Texas, where people were fed up with the phone company. And so what they did is they all overpaid their bill by one cent, one penny. And it, and it drove the home phone company crazy because the computer system couldn't deal with all these credit notices. Uh, and so they acquiesced. That's a wonderful example of how you can, you know, it takes a little bit of cleverness. That was just a little modicum of cleverness. Overpay the bills by a penny. Nothing very sophisticated, but it was enough to do it. Where's the cleverness? Where are the Olinskys? Where are the people? Uh, there are so many ways to beat the bureaucrats. One of your articles in the Harvard Business Review is about that, that we should create companies as communities. I wanted to get your, your, your insight about this. What did you mean by companies as communities? You know, I have a story in my book, Bedtime Stories for Managers, about two hotels. And one is a part of a chain, um, and it's run in a 
corporate way and you walk in and it's fine. They know what to do and so on. Um, but it feels very corporate. It doesn't feel warm, doesn't feel uh, engaging. And the staff doesn't seem to be engaged. And my experience earlier in that hotel is that every year I came back, there was a new, there was new staff there because they, because they probably unpaid them uh, or whatever. And, um, and, and it, it didn't feel um, very good. Um, one year they overcharged us on, uh, this was going back before cell phones, they were overcharging on long distance calls. We had a member in the class from British Telecom who said that for one cent a minute calls, for calls that cost them a cent a minute, they were charging $10 a minute. Um, they, were, they, were, uh, uh, they were increasing the cost by a thousand, a factor of a thousand. They were playing all kinds of games like that. And we all know these games. Then I went into another hotel. It was family owned. It was in the Lake District of England. You walk in, there's a whole different feeling. You just sense it the minute you walk in. The place is a community. The, the woman behind the desk was proudly telling us she was there seven years and the manager had been there 19 years and the sales manager had been there 16 years or something like that. She was very proud of that. The woman who owned the hotel made the pillows for the beds herself, you know, designed the pillows for the beds herself. You, you just have, I, I, at dinner the first evening, I asked about going for a hike and, and the waiter said, uh, uh, I don't know, but I'll bring the manager. And two minutes later, the manager was there spending all the time in the world telling me about every hike we could do. These places feel different. When you want, it's not a question of a greeter at the door, you know, the Walmart kind of program greeter. These places feel different. People are uh, engaged, they care, they're respected, and so they respect the company. Um, uh, you, you, just, you just get hit with it the minute you walk in, just like you get hit with the opposite the minute you walk in. You can tell. Oh, no. uh, there are two areas where you actually were, sh were showing us that there is a chasm between the theory or what is taught in schools and real life. The first one is about management. Management, as we teach it at schools, is about planning, organizing, coordinating, controlling. It assumes that the environment around us is very orderly and we're in charge. Now, your view of the management is that it's about getting interrupted, trying to keep your head above the water and trying to deal with chaos. The same thing is about also strategy. I mean, in usually the classical view of strategy is planned and predetermined, and you're actually promoting more of an emergent strategy. You're promoting a strategy as a learning process, not a planning process. You are promoting it as grounded and comes from the bottom. And it doesn't, you don't see it from the very beginning. So I just want to sort of get your feedback about this. Yeah, you know, so I went out to do a thesis um, when I was doing my doctorate and, uh, and I ended up studying five chief executives for a week and observing everything he did. Um, and as you say, I went in with uh, Henri Fayol's description of managers. He wrote that book in 1916 in French um, and he described managing as planning, organizing, collaborating, uh, planning, organizing, coordinating, I forget. All, all, this, all words for controlling, basically. Five words that mean controlling. Uh, one of them was controlling and, and so on. Um, and I'm observing these managers, you know, sort of with this image, and just go and watch a manager. Anybody who is a manager knows what happens when they walk in the door. Anybody who visits a manager knows what happens. It doesn't conform at all with this image, as you say. I found they were interrupted a lot. They were action oriented. It was all verbal and oral, uh, very little reading and writing in those days. Um, it was a whole different image. I, I saw these people spending half their time, chief executives of five major organizations in the United States, three business, one plural sector uh, uh, hospital and one public sector school system. Um, um, and I watched them uh, spending half their time with people outside their organizations. 
um, with, you know, if you're running a company with some union person, some government person, customers, suppliers, whatever it is, half their time was with outside people. Well, I was told that planning is, you know, coordinating and controlling and planning and all these things. What does that have to do with people outside? You don't control people outside. You don't plan people outside. You don't, you don't coordinate people outside. Um, and so the, the, the job was totally different. If what we think a phenomenon is, is different from what we experience it in our souls or in our gut, um, then we can't function very well because we keep thinking there's something wrong with me. The comment I got from managers more than anything else after reading my book was you make me feel so good. Well, I thought all those other people were planning, organizing, coordinating and controlling. I was being interrupted and, you know, chaos and action and all that. So, so the same thing with strategy. You know, we have all these grand illusions that uh, people um, uh, make strategy in executive meetings and they go through competitive analysis and they do all this formal stuff. I mean, you got to do some formal stuff, but that's not where strategies come from. Uh, do you have Ikea in Egypt? Yes, we uh, do. Okay. So the story of Ikea is really interesting. Ikea changed the furniture business with a brilliant strategy, which is basically taking home most of the furniture in your, in your car, in a box. So, so it saves Ikea money. It saves us money. It's more simple. We go in, we pick up the shelves or the, or the chairs we want. They're all unassembled. We bring them home. We assemble them at home, save money. Everybody's happy. Brilliant strategy run in a company run by an entrepreneur. Well, that's not where the idea came from. Didn't come from the entrepreneur. Didn't come from a board of directors. Didn't come from an executive committee. It came from a worker. This is on their own website. It came from a worker who tried to put a table in his car and it didn't fit. So he took the legs off. And then came the critical strategic moment because that had probably happened many times before. But came the critical moment when somebody said, maybe that worker, maybe somebody else said, wait a minute, if we have to take the legs off, so do our customers. And then came the corporate culture, which basically enabled an idea like that, that started with a worker to make its way to the people who could do something with it. So that's why I say strategy is a learning process. And, and it's often serendipitous. It's just lucky somebody got the idea, changed the whole furniture business. Uh, many of the most interesting strategies come that way. They don't come from formal planning. Now, I don't think anybody on earth ever developed a strategy from a formal plan. Interesting. Now, let's talk about a little bit about the role of schools of business. I mean, especially in the current situation where you have a pandemic. Uh, I know, uh, and Sharif mentioned in the beginning, I mean, your view about MBAs, MBAs is training for analytical skills and not manage, management. There, when you look at schools of business across the board, there is a, a mindset of graduates, which is really a little bit of hubris with a sense of entitlement vis-a-vis -a, -vis a sense of uh, responsibility and engaging with society. So I just wanted to sort of, let's talk a little bit about the roles of schools of management or businesses and what can, we, can be done. Well, you know, the problem with MBA programs is, is a false expectation and, and, and a major flaw. Um, there's, a, um, there's a famous comment about avoiding all the many pitfalls on our way to the grand fallacy. Um, and the grand fallacy of MBA programs is that they give the impression they're turning you into a manager. And nobody can learn management in a classroom. Management is not a science. It's not a profession. It's a practice. It's a craft. It's more craft than science. Um, and it's not learned in the classroom, it's learned on the job. And if you go to a business school and leave with the impression that you know what management is because you've learned a lot of theories about strategic planning or you've done hundreds of cases where you pretended you're the chief executive and all you really had was a few pages describing the company and no in-depth knowledge of the company, then you're a menace to society. Um, and the data on MBAs as chief executives is becoming more and more clear. 
Um, uh, we did a study years ago uh, from a book uh, out of Harvard that described in 1990 their most famous graduates. They were all chief executives, 19 of them. They were all chief executives of major, major corporations. We looked at that book about 13 years later and we went through all 19 of them and most were failures. I mean, really failures. They were fired, the company went bankrupt or some major merger backfired, whatever it was. 10 out of 19 failed. These are the best of Harvard. And another four were questionable. So five out of 19 seemed to have good records. Okay, then, then another, a couple of other studies were done that found that in general, uh, MBAs as chief, ex as, uh, chief executives um, do worse than non-MBAs and get paid more, okay? And business schools and society in general refuses to face up to the fact. Business schools are great at teaching the business functions. They teach business. They're business schools. They're not management schools. They're business schools. They teach business very well. They teach marketing. They teach finance. They teach accounting. They teach all these things. Uh, and do very well. They do not teach management. And if you take the impression given by cases in theory, you know, planning, organizing, coordinating, and controlling, um, that that's management, then, then you're a menace. And those five Harvard graduates who I guess didn't take it too seriously were the ones who did well. <laughs> okay. uh, you've sent me a an, an, uh, blog today about pollution and the pandemic. Uh, I, I'd like you to sort of comment a little about it. Yeah, let me, let me just say a final word about the, what, what, what Years ago, I was going around doing what I call my flagellation lecture. I, I was going to different business schools and telling them why MBAs are a menace. Um, and I never got challenged, really, because I was too outrageous to, they didn't know what to say. Um, uh, but then they started asking a question that should never be asked of an academic, which is, what are you doing about it? Um, I'm an academic. I'm not supposed to do anything about anything. I'm just supposed to criticize, right? Um, anyway, we got embarrassed. <laughs> we got embarrassed. Then we created the IMPM, IMPM.org, the International Master's Program for Managers, a business program where we take people who are managers, most of them without any managerial training, as such, we take people, I mean, I mean, business school training, we take people, we sit them at round tables in a flat classroom, and half the time they're learning from each other, they're sharing experience, they're uh, reflecting on their own experience, they're sharing it with each other. Um, and it's very powerful because we bring our theories, that's the other half of the class time, they bring their experience and together that creates an open conversation and discussion. Very, very powerful. So, so, um, um, so, so, and then we did a healthcare program called imhl.org, which does the same thing for healthcare. And by the way, has had some wonderful people from Egypt in the healthcare program and, and in the business program. Uh, some wonderful people from Egypt. So, so we, you know, there is an alternative, which is to keep MBA programs for functional training for non-managers and use and use the uh, business schools to, as management schools to take people with experience and respect that experience in the classroom. You know, Wharton for years, maybe they still used to boast that you get the same thing in the Wharton EMBA that you get in the Wharton MBA. They were boasting that they could do no more with people for people with 10 or 20 years of experience than they did with kids who had no experience. And they were boasting about it. I mean, that's the state of the business school. So as far as the pandemic is concerned, um, a, a couple of things. Um, using the balance framework, um, uh, this is how I see it. Governments are supposed to protect us. Businesses are supposed to supply us. And communities are supposed to engage us. Um, the countries that are doing best, for the most part, uh, have a balance across those things. But uh, unlike the United States and Britain and Brazil, where the governments are uh, and the, and the uh, uh, presidents, prime ministers are utterly irresponsible, utterly and totally irresponsible, and government is not protecting the citizens, in the countries that are doing well, in Scandinavia and Germany and New Zealand, 
um, uh, they have that balance and they have cooperation. So governments protect, uh, businesses provide and communities uh, engage, but in collaboration. Uh, the countries that are doing the worst don't have that collaboration and don't have that kind of balance across those three. Um, uh, one last thing about the pandemic, I've been spending six months, um, as I just sent it, to you uh, uh, yesterday, I I've been spending six months um, pursuing another take on the pandemic, which is that uh, what, not, what are now called aerosols, namely, namely uh, uh, viruses attaching to tiny particles that can move beyond the one or two meters, um, and especially the role of pollution and smoke in carrying those those uh, viruses around could be a major factor in stopping a second wave and getting us out of this mess. Um, and so you could share that piece or hope, hope maybe it could be published in, in Egypt. It's already being published in some other countries around the world. Um, and, and that's what I've been doing basically on the pandemic. Okay, now I'm gonna uh, take some questions now from the audience. The way I'm gonna do it, I think we, we'll try it. I will unmute and allow people to sort of ask the questions themselves to sort of get a little bit more of an interaction. I have questions from uh, Nadil Anani, uh, Raymond Sanner, and Shirwet. So I'm going to unmute and I'm going to ask them. I'm going to start with Nelly. Nelly, floor is yours, my dear. Hi. Uh, hi, Henry. I'm glad that you joined us. I remember reading your work when I was at university doing my undergrad. And um, I just want to just talk a little bit about um, your book. So in your book on rebalancing society, you talk about um, predatory capitalism and obviously exploitative enterprises. And I know that, that you perhaps are a little bit critical, I think as are a lot of people now, of uh, Milton Friedman, you know, when he talks about the role of the private sector, business of business, you know, in the course of the 70s wave, which probably added a lot to, uh, you know, what we saw in the 80s and 90s with globalization and big corporate. Um, and then you sort of um, talk then a little bit about, you know, the exclusive populism, which obviously we're seeing a lot in the way of social movements. And, you know, your perspective on social movements in terms of, you know, what we're seeing now. But I think a lot of the social movements that we're seeing are, you know, perhaps fueled by, and rightly so, gender, ethnicity, um, religion, obviously political dismay, all of these factors. And I know that you, and we'll not go into that, you know, touch on the, the Muslim Brotherhood and some views about, about that. Um, my question is, um, and I suppose even relatedly to the role of the business school is, um, you know, there's been some suggestions that entrepreneurship is, you know, somehow uh, a, a response as is populism to what we're seeing across the world. Um, you know, innovation like, you know, I think you also mentioned Davos as well. So I'd like to kind of understand and maybe with the perspective of, of the business school is, and I know you're critical of the MBA program and, you know, other, other programs, but I mean, business schools as are all higher education institutions, they are there to build character as well. And yes, we can't teach people to become managers, but we can in some ways engage in character building in, in business school. So what, what role do you think um, enterprises, entrepreneurship, whether it's in the mask or the facade of populism or otherwise, what role do you think that they have in society, especially in an emerging society like Egypt, you know, what, what role do they play in being game changers, in being, you know, sort of maybe not as radical as, as social movements or populist movements, but, you know, it's sort of changing and, and causing, you know, societal disruption. Yeah. So I'd like a little bit of perspective um, from you about that, please. Yeah, you know, anybody, um, one of the things I say is that we're all part of the plural sector, everybody, uh, in the sense that, that we may work in business, we may vote for governments, um, but our private lives are lived significantly in the plural sector, whether we work out at the Y, belong to a club, volunteer for Greenpeace, um, whatever it is, uh, volunteer in a, in a school, uh, you know, a not-for-profit school, 
Uh, I teach at McGill, which is a plural sector organization and so on. We're all part of the plural sector. So whether you're in business or not, you're still part of the plural sector. Um, but of course, the question was not what that, that, that addresses what businessmen and businesswomen can do, namely be citizens, uh, um, uh, but what can they do in their businesses? Um, the one thing they can't do is change the game. I you use the term game changer. I think um, I'm, I'm not of the belief that this is about fixing capitalism. Uh, I think that's a mistaken orientation. Uh, not that I don't think capitalism needs fixing. Capitalism absolutely needs fixing. We should get rid of the damn stock market and executive compensation schemes that are ridiculous, and, and we should get rid of short-term uh, uh, you know, stock payouts, and all that is corrupt, okay? Certainly need to fix capitalism, but fixing capitalism will not fix society. I've got a collection of what I call adjectival capitalism, uh, all the different forms of capitalism, you know, uh, 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 engaging capitalism, progressive capitalism, democratic, I love democratic capitalism. Capitalism is the noun and democracy is somehow the adjective. Um, um, and that says it all in a way. Um, capitalism is not going to fix this. And fixing capital is not going to fix this. We need to put capitalism in its place, which is the marketplace. That's where it belongs. Nobody can argue with that. Capitalism belongs in the marketplace. It doesn't belong in the public space. It doesn't belong with all the lobbying and all the corruption and all the bribery that's going on now. Um, and that has to, that has to stop. Um, what can business schools do about that? Well, in part, business schools can be management schools um, and can also be exposing people to the plural, to plural sector associations, for example. And the norm in our own business school, actually it's a faculty of management in our case, in our own management faculty, there's enormous amount of, of initiatives, social initiatives and so on, especially not the MBAs, but, but the BCOMs, the bachelor's students. They're engaged in all kinds of things. So there's wonderful stuff going on, absolutely wonderful stuff going on. And, um, and that can happen in business schools like can, can happen anywhere else but don't expect that business is going to solve this problem. The Americans believe that. They've always believed that. They're dead wrong. Business is the problem, not because there's anything wrong with markets and, and, and competition, but because business is out of control in the public space. That's the problem. Okay. Uh, Raymond, please unmute yourself. Raymond Sanner. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just wanted to come back to uh, Henry, what you said about rebalancing uh, the three sectors. I'm working with co-authors on a book on public goods. And I was wondering to what extent might it be useful uh, to get everybody to the same table to discuss creation and maintaining and preserving public goods, which should be in the interest of business as well as governments, as well as, of course, civil society. And to what extent could that be useful for the uh, collaborative sp spirit that you mentioned before? And just on a little anecdote, you were part of a panel that we organized at the Academy of Management many years ago. My wife and partner, Lijia, organized a panel about action research. And there you already, I think it's about 10 or 15 years ago, you emphasized the fact that action research lost the reflection part. You know, it's just action, action, and at the end there's no more time to, to, to think, to, to discuss. And I would, think, I, I would think that that is very much needed to have breathing space to talk about common interests and then uh, look for from there to move towards solutions. I, I was just wondering what your, your suggestion is. And I would be very much appreciated if all the books and publications you mentioned will be available for us to, to find out where to look for them. Um, yeah, um, first of all, I agree with both things totally. 
Um, yes, absolutely. Um, this is a public good. Um, I'm not getting paid. Uh, I'm enjoying doing it. Uh, it's available to anybody. And if you put it on YouTube or wherever, it'll be available freely. Um, so on. My piece called, um, the piece I referred to called Pollution and Pandemic um, is in the Creative Commons, which I guess you know about. Uh, not everybody does, but you presumably do. Uh, the Creative Commons means it's out there and you can do it, you can take and reprint it, do what you like with it. It's, it's in the Creative Commons, it's mitzberg.org slash pp, and people can do what they like with it. They, they can and change it or change my words, um, but they can publish it and reprint it and post it and, and so on and so forth. So, so the, the idea of public goods and the commons uh, is critically, absolutely critically important. Look, I own this shirt. You can't have it. That's my shirt. Um, but uh, do I own my, my ideas? Um, does a pharmaceutical company really own its, own its patents when those are dependent on research that was paid for by the government and they could never have gotten those patents if that research wasn't done by the government? We have to revisit public and private goods. Um, and and uh, Wikipedia and the Creative Commons and open source uh, software and all the rest um, is moving absolutely in in the right direction. Um, as far as reflection and action, you know, uh, there's a five part series that I also posted that you can access um, on my blog, mensburg.org slash blog, um, uh, called Donald Trump is not the problem. Parts one, two, three, four, five. Um, and, um, and one of those parts talks about reflection in America. Uh, and, and the Americans are a people of action. They're not a people of reflection, particularly, not that there are no reflective people in the country, but Americans are not intrinsically reflective people the way, uh, the Indians are very reflective. The, the educated Indians are very reflective, for example. Um, but, uh, but um, so, so, so uh, things go on that I look at and I say, like, how could nobody see this? I mean, 40% of the American population supports Trump. Um, and, and to me, it's not left or right. There are plenty of right-wing politicians who I may not agree with, but I don't think they're idiots. I, I do think Donald Trump is an idiot, but that's apparent to any thinking person on earth. Um, how they could be fooled by this guy who's an absolute monstrosity, um, uh, amazes me. It absolutely amazes me. So there's an utter lack of reflection. One last comment, everything I've published, at least all my articles on mintzberg.org slash articles and slash books, all my publications are there. Um, all my articles should be accessible unless the journal makes them not accessible. Um, uh, the most important book in this regard is Rebalancing Society. And I talked my publisher into allowing me to put a PDF on my website. Um, you can see it right there on the homepage. Uh, anybody can download that book in its entirety uh, uh, as a PDF on their, own on their own computer. So that one, I mean, obviously we write books so that publishers can make money and I can be able to eat dinner. Um, but but um, that one is uh, is available to everybody because I think that one belongs in the commons, um, in a way. So so yeah, a whole set of interesting comments okay. from you. I mean, <laughs> we'll we'll take two more questions. We might extend a little bit, like beyond the one hour mark. We might take an extra five minutes or so. So I'm gonna have Shirwet now, and then next uh, Professor Devia Singal. Shirwet. Thank you. Um, so uh, I am the director of the MBA and executive MBA programs here. So, and I took every word you said um, wholly. And um, I do promise you we don't promote the EMBA and the MBA uh, uh, as one. We completely identify the differences. So uh, I think that's a start, but definitely uh, I'll, I'll dig deeper into that. Uh, my question actually has to do with your framework, the pathway to balance. Um, it kind of looks like a system, you know, where there's an input and an output and some process in between. 
And I have a problem with the, the, the wording of the output where you say dynamic balance. For me, it's a bit of an oxymoron or, you know, uh, how do you measure that? I'm assuming the book would mention that, but if you can briefly brief that. And um, if it's dynamic, then how do you keep from not being there, not staying there and not moving back to an imbalanced situation? Can you help with that? Thank you. Okay. Um, first of all, as far as the EMBA is concerned, I think you should look at our, our we have an EMBA that's modeled after the IMPM, uh, but the mothership is the IMPM or the .org or the or IMHL.org. Is, is also a very good rendition of it. Um, and, and you should take a good look at that for your EMBA program because we created an EMBA program modeled after the IMPM and it does all those things. They sit at round tables, they share their experience, they, they get half the class time for learning from their own experience and reflecting on their experience and so on. So, so um, yeah, if you run the EMBA program, have a look. Maybe yes. you have it, okay. you do some of that anyway. Um, <laughs> As far as dynamic balance is concerned, I don't think, I, I think defining balance in some rigid or firm way would be dogmatic. Um, 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 because look, let me give an example. One country that's dealing well with the pandemic is China. It's probably the exception um, in a way, being so out of balance. I mean, it's totally, out of balance on the side of public sector. But you know what, when things are really dire, uh, sometimes you need a very, very strong government to just say, this is damn well what you're gonna do. Instead of people in Massachusetts or Texas or California begging people not to go to bars and so on. Sometimes government has to be strong and say, you are not going to bars, we're stopping it. They're doing a bit of that, but the Chinese were able to do that much more forcibly. So you swing to one sector, you swing to another sector, but, but over time, you need that kind of um, dynamic balance. In other words, the three sectors have to work together. Um, how do you stop one sector from taking over? Uh, I mean, that's the $84 trillion question um, because sectors have always taken over and you've got, uh, and you've got the, you know, uh, with Marxism, the public sector took over, uh, and with populism, the in Venezuela, the plural sector took over, and in America, you've got the private sector taking over. You've just got to be vigilant. What's that audio? You've, you've, you've just got to be vigilant, and uh, you've just got to be vigilant. My phone went, I forgot to turn off. You just have to be vigilant, and, uh, um, and, and people, uh, have to stand up for what's right. Uh, the Supreme Court of the United States will go down um, as the seller out of the American Constitution and, and of the American balance and of the American democracy. They destroyed it with the Citizens United decision that opened the floodgates to corruption. You know, I, when I meet Bra Brazilians in a group, I say, which country is more corrupt, Brazil or America? And I say, it's clearly America. Because in Brazil, the corruption is criminal and they're dealing with it. In America, the corruption is legal. The Supreme Court legalized bribery. You can give as much money as you like to election campaigns. It's destroying the country. And, and this is, it, 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 it's monstrous what the Supreme Court did. Okay. Now, the last question is uh, Professor Singal. Can you unmute yourself? No, I can't. Yes, yes, you know. Yeah, namaste. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> namaste, Professor. I'm Divya from Goa, India. And part of my question is being answered, but I, I just wanted to ask that many business schools are still operating in functional silos. Uh, so, you know, your, your approach towards like action oriented approach, integrating reflection, or, you know, having more and more service learning uh, pedagogy based kind of courses multidisciplinary approach. Do you think that, you know, if the business schools adopt this approach, they will be able to develop better, uh, you know, uh, citizens or future managers, what they need to do? Yeah. Well, yeah, what they need to do to, you know, part of the problem, you know, it, it, it's, it's like saying, what should any organization do that's lost its way? 
um, because it's no different, I think, in business schools, people get established into their, uh, not just habitual responses, but responses that are convenient to them. If I'm used to teaching my case class day after day after day, year after year after year, um, ignoring the fact that I'm asking 23-year-olds to pretend they're chief executives of companies they don't understand, or even 28-year-olds, or even 40-year-olds for that matter, to pronounce on companies they really know nothing about and, and say that the way you make a decision in a company is by reading 10 pithy pages and pronouncing the next day on what it should do without knowing the people, the players, the, the markets, the, color, the products, nothing, nothing. Just what you read in 10 pages written by a research assistant. Um, um, uh, if that's convenient for you, you're not going to change until somebody puts enough pressure on you and says, this is a farce. So uh, in that particular regard, have a look on my blog uh, on something called Jack's Turn. I, I forget how I called it in, in the blog, but it's, in, it's also in my book, Bedtime Stories for Managers. It's about a student at a business school. It's Harvard. It sounds like Harvard. It's not a real story, but it's about Jack who is asked, who's told that managers are decisive, good managers are decisive, therefore... Therefore, good students take a stand and they stand up to things and, they, and they're not, and they're courageous. So Jack gets up, he's cold called the way Harvard does to make sure they read the case. Cold called about what this great big company never heard of before yesterday should do. And he says, that, he says this is a farce. This, do you want me to speak up? I'll speak up. This is a farce. How can I possibly talk about what that company should do? Okay, well, Show a few people who do cases that and ask them what their answer is. Ask them how they respond to that. You know, a shock effect isn't a bad idea. I, I mean, I spend my life writing shock effects that nobody reads. So business schools don't change because nobody, no case study teacher is running around reading that, reading that story. Um, but maybe they should be confronted with it. Henry, I, I really thank you for a brilliant discussion. I mean, we could probably spend another hour going through questions, but uh, we're, we're committed for, for, for an hour. I yes, really thank yeah. you for your participation. I also want to thank uh, Gaida Selim, uh, who's one of your students in your uh, uh, healthcare management uh, masters, for mm -hmm. actually doing the introduction and facilitating having you uh, uh, on this seminar. I also thank Sant. Uh, so thank you, Ali. Really thank you, Ali. I enjoyed really it. Ne next week, we're going to have Professor Andrew Fisher. He's from the uh, in, uh, Institute of Social Studies in the Netherlands. He's going to talk about a very interesting topic, poverty as ideology. What, he has a book with that title. What he's talking about here is that the very conception of poverty is inherently political. And what he's talking about, the way we measure it, is actually targeting and segregational social provisioning instead of more universalistic uh, and more solidaristic form of provision. It's actually counter development. Uh, so it, it, it's interesting. I mean, uh, now I will, I will pass to Sharif to sort of conclude and thank Henry Mintzberg. And I thank you all for staying a little beyond the time. Sharif. Thank you, Ali, and, and thank you, Henry, so much. This has been very enlightening. We touched upon so many things. The world is changing, I mean, extremely fast, and, and, and you've touched upon so many of the fundamental issues that uh, um, basically many countries around the world are, are facing, uh, not just the developed world, but the developing and the developed world. Um, uh, I always say that uh, we, we, we talk about change. Uh, people promote change, push for change, but they never want to change. We've seen over the past uh, six months that people actually do change, but maybe if they don't have a choice uh, and if they're forced um, and they see the merit. Um, I, I, I absolutely uh, agree with you that the, the, the sort of the basic infrastructure in the community is actually the plural sector. We all are part of the plural sector. And, and in, I mean, some, some, some of the literature do not cover uh, many parts of the world. Uh, Egypt actually has been known for this plural sector for over hundreds of years. Uh, I'm not saying it, and, and naturally and unfortunately in the past was even more effective than today. If you look at the numbers, for example, 
uh, the NGO infrastructure in Egypt uh, actually adds up to close to 50,000. Uh, obviously, not all of them are active, but a good uh, 28, 29,000 are, are active. Uh, you look back at Egypt's very first uh, university was actually coming out of the, uh, of the uh, uh, so pruler sector and the foundations that were all over the place back then. They're not as effective today as before. And I think that's part of the problem that we are facing as a community. The stronger the pruler sector, the more it's empowered, the more it can actually play a, a role in the community. Uh, you can see how communities can be uh, transformed. Um, again, thank you so much for, for, for today, for, for joining us as our guest speaker. We look forward uh, definitely for more interaction in the future. And uh, God knows maybe uh, if, if, that, if there will not be, not be a, a second wave or if we get over this pandemic, uh, we definitely look forward to extending an invitation so you can visit us in our campus in Cairo uh, in the near future. Thank you so much for today. And I would like to thank everybody who attended our uh, webinar today. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye.